Why is it so important to breathe through the nose? Is the link with rhinitis and sleep. Open mouth breathing during sleep is a risk factor for our OSA and is associated with increased disease severity and upper airway collapsibility. And I think the, the relationship is quite strong. Sleep disorder breathing can both result from and be worsened by nasal obstruction. During sleep, this is an interesting paper now. This is a huge result and I wouldn't expect such a good result. But during sleep, upper airway resistance was much higher while breathing through the mouth. In addition, obstructive but not central apneas and hypopneas were profoundly more frequent breathing orally. 43 breathing through the mouth and 1.5 breathing through the nose. Now, I had to look at that paper a couple of times to ask, is that actually correct? And that's what's published, Fitzpatrick's paper. Um, he's based in the Northern Ireland Hospital. But here is another paper, and he's also involved with this. The treatment of nasal obstruction was associated with a dramatic and sustained reduction in nasal resistance and the oral fraction of ventilation during sleep. So there was an absolute reduction in the percent, the fraction of ventilation breathing through the mouth reduced by 30%. Now there was a modest change in OSA here, but the key here is the nose was decongested, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the individual was breathing through it. If you're decongesting the nose, we have to ensure that the individual is actually going to breathe through the nose. If we have the mouth open for a period of time, we develop a habit of oral breathing, we lose muscle tone, so when we sleep, it's very likely that our mouth is going to remain open. And towards the end, I'll give you a couple of strategies that may help, that we use, in keeping the mouth closed. We have to ensure that the mouth is closed. Helping the nose isn't always sufficient. And here was one study, it was in Taiwan, and they looked at, we use a paper tape. And they looked at a paper tape, they called it a porous oral patch. 30 patients that greater than five events per hour, less than 15, all of them slept using the, the pop. The upper sleep scale before the tape was 8.1, and using the tape reduced to 5.2. The visual analog scale came down from 7.5 to 2.4. The medium AHI reduced significantly from 12 to 7.8. Now that would be more of a normal result that I would expect. It reduced the AHI index by 33%. Now that's just breathing through the nose. That wasn't looking at reducing nasal resistance. And that wasn't looking at reducing breathing volume. And if you were to add myofunctional therapy on top of that, what sort of result would we get? Those are the key things. From my point of view, you're looking at airway, and I'm looking at what's going through it. Let's get the nose decongested. Let's get the breathing volume down, and let's get breathing through the nose. And add myofunctional therapy on top of that, and it will enhance the benefits. If we do nasal surgery, here 14 patients presented complaining of nasal congestion after previous nasal surgery. And they, oh, sorry. and they appear to have an adequate nasal airway, but no evidence of nasal valve collapse. They were evaluated for hyperventilation syndrome. Individuals that have a blocked nose for a period of time develop a habit of breathing too much. It's easier to breathe through the mouth than breathe through the nose. When they looked at the respiratory rate, all patients had an elevated respiratory rate of 18 breaths per minute upper thoracic breathing, because if you breathe through your mouth, you'll tend to breathe using the upper chest. 12 of the 14 patients complaining of nasal obstruction had an elevated Nijmegen score, indicative of hyperventilation syndrome. Nijmegen questionnaire is a validated questionnaire to assess for hyperventilation. And on average, there was two and a half procedures had been performed in each patient. My point here is, if we treat the nose, whether it's with nasal corticosteroids, whether it's with nasal operations, it's also important to look at the individual's breathing. If we have the mouth open for a period of time, we have to help that person switch from mouth to nose breathing, both in adults, but also in children. So the conclusion was, 
that hyperventilation syndrome should be included in the differential diagnosis of patients presenting with nasal congestion, particularly after failed nasal surgery. Or we could have showed these individuals how to decongest the nose in the first instance. I had a nasal operation in 1994. I continued mouth breathing. I continued having obstructive sleep apnea. I continued having asthma. And 20 years under medical care, not one healthcare professional said, Patrick, breathe through your nose. That's regrettable. That's regrettable. How far do they know about this? Has anybody seen this advert before? This is obviously going back a long, long time. Stop mouth breathing and snoring. The perfect breather overcomes snoring and mouth breathing. And that's the message that we're trying to get. So I'm not here to criticize the CPAP, it works. But I'm here to show you this. Because the CPAP is the gold standard of care. But one negative aspect of the CPAP machine is they can act as an orthodontic headgear and move the teeth in the upper and lower jaw backwards. You don't want that. You want to have the airway as far forward on the face as possible. We've heard it so many times. This effect can increase over time and may or may not cause TMJ disorders in some patients. These facial changes have been dubbed smashed face syndrome. This is a 2010 paper published in Chest Journal. Now this is probably more relevant to children because they're more pliable to the effects of the lower and upper jaw being pushed in on the airways. And when we're looking at mouth breathing, I was looking at Christian Guimano's at the papers that he has authored because he is saying that if you breathe through your mouth up to 44% of the time during sleep, it's not an issue. But it is an issue if you breathe for a minimum of 44% and a maximum of 100% of your total sleep time. So that's his thesis on it. Now we would say we want the mouth closed 100% of the time. But I think it's interesting to consider that.